What's going on, people? Check one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. How's everyone doing this? Well, it's evening over here in the UK. I'm sweltering in my house right now, absolutely boiling. Um, weather's nice, so I can't complain too much. Um, but what's going on, everyone? Just, uh, I'm hoping that everyone can hear me right now. I'm going to do what I normally do and just ask you to give me a shout. Let me know that you can hear me loud and clear. Give me a shout. Just like put something in the chat box and say, yes, King, we can see you. We can hear you. And then I know we're good. Everything checks. Thank you, Wesco. And you can see a comment sitting on the screen. So I've got a nice, I learned something. It took me a little while, <laughs> but I can feature comments now which is really cool because I can now reference Markham X had red hair and freckles. <laughs> I don't know why I selected that one, but I can now um, reference the comment, which is nice, you know? So um, yeah, we are getting there. We are getting there. We are definitely getting there. So um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today on this live stream. And those of you who are in here, you know what the topic is because um, you can see it on the screen and obviously it's a bit of a silly title i.e were they read but it doesn't it shouldn't be too it shouldn't be a very long live stream today i know we do have a habit of going on for a couple of hours but i don't think that's going to be the case in this one because i'm, I'm not going to go too deep this is more going to be a a pictorial study than anything and hopefully just a bit of a logical discussion about the use of color in comedic artwork and perhaps why they chose the colors that they did and essentially how it yeah how essentially just how it um was used in ancient kemet um thank you everybody saying that they like the shirt this is available okay this is one of the designs that is available in the store so if you haven't been recently to the spring store please do check it out um obviously if you buy merchandise from there it really helps the channel it's kind of one of my um, income streams um, I'll be obviously very transparent with you so it helps me to be able to produce more content um, so if you want to support directly or just by buying some merch I'm very grateful either which way um, don't like to ask for too much from you guys because you're a very generous community as it stands um, and you're also very generous with your support and your feedback and that makes um, things really easy for me um, in terms of like wanting to sacrifice my time and my effort and grow this community because it's a beautiful thing. So yeah, thank you everybody. Um, greetings, Talia, um, always online. Um, I, I mean, I could shout out everybody. Um, I'm probably gonna go a little bit crazy with this little new widget feature that I've got. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> you don't understand how long I've been trying to figure out how to do this. So um, yeah, uh, I'm really happy about that. But um, I think we can kind of just like, I think we can dive in now um, because basically this topic, like I said, it's not going to be an incredibly difficult one for us to to go through. But I think it's a good topic just to kind of like look at from a picture and from a logical perspective, have a discussion um, and basically come to, you know, create a conclusion. You know, I've got a conclusion about it. I'm not going to impose my conclusion upon people. I'm just going to tell you what my interpretation is. Um, and my interpretation is very logical. In fact, I could give you a spoiler right now. Um, they were being realistic. There you go. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Okay. They were being realistic. So let's answer the first question, actually. Just looking at the the screen that we can see at the moment. Let me make it full screen, actually. So were they really red? And the whole red race argument or the whole kind of over complication and actually that's probably a really good term one of the tenets of egyptology is to create complexity where it doesn't exist you know let's take a african civilization that sits on the african continent and make it non-african how do we do that we create complexity let's take dark-skinned mummies <laughs> and claim they weren't dark to begin with they were actually, you know, the opposite colour and they darkened through the process of mummification. Once again, complexity where it doesn't need to exist. Let's take African culture like bare chest, sorry, bare chest, bare feet 
Afros. Let's take all of these kind of features of African culture that we know exist and let's claim that they're wigs and an extreme tan. <laughs> creating complexity where it doesn't need to exist. It's just ancient Egypt or Kemet works when you look at it through a logical lens. And I have a much more extensive video that I've been in the process of producing for a very long time now that covers cultural continuity. And it's, it's not something that necessarily needs an extra video because I cover it as a topic so much in my various videos, but I am going to do kind of a dedicated video that just looks at how African ancient Kemet was in terms of a, as a civilization, how tribal, and I know some people get offended by that word, but you know, I don't know, I don't find it very offensive. You know, we talk about having tribes in Africa um, and the tribal nature of our, you know, it, it, call it African culture you can call it what you like but you know you can't turn around look at a, you know a group of central west east southern Africans walking around in barefoot and in nothing but a skirt in the heat of the tropic in the heat of the tropics or in the heat of the Sahara or in the heat of you know African the African continent and then call it tribal and then when you see exactly the same thing taking place in ancient Kemet try and call it something else it's the same thing it's the same culture um so I could really really dive into that topic because that's a really interesting one but I do want to just kind of like have this discussion have a look through loads of pictures and see actually is there is there any truth to the arguments that you hear about the red race um were they a red race was it as <laughs> You know, I'm laughing. But what was it like? You know, influences like Metatron and lots of Egypt Egyptologists say, "Oh, you know, it was just the tan." You know, <laughs> you know, it did. They were really olive skinned people. You know, like me. But what happened is they went into the sun for a very long time, and this is the color that they turn when it, the sun cooks their skin. And the women are yellow because they don't go in this. I mean, this is once again mental gymnastics. Once again, complexity where it doesn't need to exist. Can we just respect that this is the color of many, many Africans? Can we do that? I don't know. Can we do that? All right. So um, as usual, I'm going to get lots of comments. I can imagine. Please do contribute. I, you know, I'll pause at certain times to kind of try and fly through the comments. But obviously, if you want your comment read out instantly, I will prioritize the super chats. So, yeah, if you can, or I mean, if you want to have your comment read out instantly, that's the way you'll get my instant attention. But other than that, I will be diving in and trying to pull out comments every now and then and pop them on the screen because I can. You know, I can. Um, <laughs> let me do that really quickly before I actually get started. I'm going to find one and just do it just for the, just for the sake of it, because this is the, the novelty is not going to wear off for a little while for me. Um, for people that there you go, I like that one. Here we go. For people that are getting confused with the color. Look at the hairstyle. Yeah, come on. And we talked about this hairstyle already. This is the I call this the comedic short twist. I've got a video. Um, a short actually if you haven't checked it out check out my shorts i've got a short dedicated to this hairstyle and it just covers it in very in lots of detail this hairstyle is not only depicted by the ancient Kem kemites or the you know the ancient egyptians themselves on most of their statues it's also been depicted on them by the ancient romans so if you look at my um, video for instance about the um, crocodiles and I don't know if you've had a chance to check out my I've got a documentary on crocodiles and in that you have a portrait of a Dendaran uh, that is an upper upper Egyptian or upper Kemite um, standing on the back of a or at least you know doing you know acrobatics on the back of a crocodile this was an upper Egyptian and he's depicted with this hairstyle but from their perspective so they really make an effort to kind of like individualize the 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 locks or the twists or whatever you want to call them but this is an african hairstyle you know you can't achieve this and you can't make up that excuse of oh you know they wore you know it's it's really funny because you listen to new, to um egyptologists and they'll, they'll they'll they understand this is an african hairstyle so rather than you know tackle the fact that you know obviously ancient you know, Egyptians or Kemites um, wore African hairstyles because they're African. They'll prefer to say that they had, you know, Nubian wigs, <laughs> you know, for, so for the entirety of the, you know, 3,000 year existence 
of this civilization, they wore ni they wore wigs to look like their southern neighbors. This is the stupidity that you know we have to deal with, and then they have the nerve to turn to us and say, you know, <laughs> you're stealing our history. It's like, come on, like just just call it African history. No one's trying to steal anything. Just acknowledge the fact that this is an African, you know, an African civilization. But anyway, rant over, and I'm gonna get rid of the feature comment now, and we're gonna dive in. Okay. Um, <laughs> can you believe that? I've got, oh, by the way, actually, I'm going to put that comment on the screen really quickly because, um, by the way, I've got a video coming and actually, I'm, I'm actually quite excited about and I'm going to be revisiting Queen T again. And before you're saying, oh my God, Queen T again, you've got about 50 videos of Queen T. The reason is because I did some research actually and I found out, well, I did some research and I've learned something new about hairstyling amongst women in along basically along Ni Nilo Saharan area. So from Chadic women to Sudanese women, um, basically along that Nilo Saharan basin, um, how women style their hair. And it, it was a, my mind blew when I kind of saw these videos and so much of comedic culture that maybe I've touched on but haven't gone in deep on was actually it made sense now how they achieved certain hairstyles and to give a little bit of a spoiler if you watch my documentary about you know essentially were the it's about mummies and I think it's called White Nordics but check out if you haven't checked out it's quite an old it's quite an old well I say old a few months ago now going back but in that I postulated the fact that um Queen T's hair, they go on and on and about the fact that Queen T's hair is kind of like, it looks wavy and it's brown. And I said, look, very logically, it's discolored because it wasn't found in a sarcophagus. It had been sitting out for, you know, God knows how many thousands of years. Um, so obviously, you know, black hair, African hair weathers and it changes color um, when it's exposed to the elements. But that aside, the waviness of the hair wasn't actually its natural waviness. And I wasn't saying this to say that Africans can't have wavy hair because I know that Africans can have wavy hair. But I was saying this because I recognised what I saw was a twist out. And I said, what you can see here, this is what you call a, a twist out or a braid out. When you have braids in your hair, because all of the comedic queens are buried with braids. So in fact, let me just quickly have a little bit of a, a little bit of a spoiler here. <laughs> I'm going to do a little bit of a spoiler up here. Me. I'm going to show you some images. Where are we? I've lost my, oh, here we go. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, bear with me. Okay, so here, I'm just gonna quickly do a bit of a spoiler before I go into de in depth in this one, but all ancient comedic queens are always buried with braids, all of them, every single one. And the only one that it didn't find with braids was Queen T. Queen T's hair wasn't in braids or wasn't in any kind of kind of locking hair. It was just out and it was loose. And obviously, to me, it was like, well, you know, if the if the mummy's been, you know, mishandled and mistreated by grave robbers, you know, it's loosed out. Something's happened to basically where the braids have been loosed out, and the hair looks like a braid out. It's wavy, but it's kind of retaining that kind of like stiffness and kink where the waves aren't like like they're. They're a result of braids being taken out. I don't know how to say it. It's the uniformness of the pattern. I don't know. I can just see it. I'm quite good at spotting those kind of things. So I said it and I didn't have 100% proof that I was correct until now. Now I've got the proof that that theory is not a theory. It's fully correct. Her hair is definitely a braid out. And I'm going to show you that video, but not today. I'm just kind of like sidetracking like i normally do but anyway let's let's go into our to our video today let's go into our video today because we're going to tackle color in chemi i hope everyone's not getting too bored because i'm always, always get sidetracked when i'm having my little discussions how many are live 107 if you haven't hit up the like please do hit up the like button um so youtube will share this okay so um yeah i'm gonna get started now so bear with me because I might not be able to respond to comments because I do want to gather a little bit of momentum now. So where to start? I'm just going to start here. Okay. So this is one of the most famous <laughs> for some strange reason. Uh, this is one of the most famous kind of like Egyptian or Kemetic piece of artwork because this is one of the ones that they tried to pass off as someone who perhaps is an African. By the way, I look at this face and I, I just fully see an African. 
Okay, I don't, I don't know about you, but I just fully see in Africa. I know so many people who have this exact face. But what throws you off? Why? Why is it that we look at this statue and there's, you know, or at least, you know, Arab centrics and Eurocentrics feel confident to put this front and centre? Um, why is that? And the simple answer is we can see that um, the reason why they want to put it front and centre is because essentially they're trying to pass off the fact that this tone that it has, this tonality is essentially, you know, Arab skin. Now, we can clearly see that what's in front of us is the result of some pretty rampant fading that has taken place. And the reason that's significant is because fading, so I'm just going to get rid of that comment now, just bear with me. Okay. Still learning. <laughs> what is going on? Scroll. There we go. Okay. Comment gone. There we go. All right, sorry. So the reason that is significant is because fading on comedic artwork is basically one of their favorite tools for adding ambiguity. So we still spoke to spoke about the fact that they rely on ambiguity and complexity where it doesn't exist. So what do they do? They get faded statues or faded pieces of artwork and they say this faded color that you're witnessing is the true color. But then when they have dark pieces of artwork there in front of them, they'll come up with excuses like, oh, it's darkened over time or the varnish is darkened or this, that and the other. They'll come up with all the stupid excuses, regardless of how well preserved it is. But when you can see something that clearly, I mean, you can see the cracks in this wood. OK, this has clearly suffered some immense, you know, kind of exposure to the elements for it to be where it is at the moment. They will put this front and centre. Now, another thing that I'm going to kind of, um share with you is that they also have some very um what's the word i'm looking for some very sneaky tricks that they use when it comes to these kind of faded bits of artwork now what is the number one trick that they like to use what they like to do and this is something where perhaps you need to have kind of more you know, familiarity with this in artwork is that they like to restore the blacks or black color, or the really, really dark colors where they had faded before. So if you look around the eyes, that ring around the eyes, that's been restored, okay? That would have faded with the rest of the statue. That's a guarantee. Why do I know this is a guarantee? Because the statue would have been painted or varnished, okay? And the black paint would have sat on top of the varnish naturally so if the varnish had scraped off on all of that then the black paint around the eyes would have also scraped off but if the black paint is now sitting there thick and preserved someone has come along and repainted that now to a lot of people that might seem harmless but what that does is that creates the illusion of contrast and it creates the illusion of deliberacy so it makes it look like because this is now painted fresh it makes it look like the entire thing that this was the deliberate tone that they were after so can you see how they do that? And I'll, I'll give you another, a couple of other examples of this as well. But I'm just going to quickly um, scroll along. So you can see here, the one of the reasons I showed you this is because, you know, stature wise, this looks like an African man to me. I'm going to make really broad sweeping statements here and say, look, he still has, you know, tropical limb proportions. I, you can see he's got quite a long tibia bone you can see he's got very broad shoulders and i know that sounds really generalized but these are african traits so i still see an african man here irrespective of the fact that it's faded over time but that's just me um i think i can see differences um and like i said these differences isn't just me saying okay he's black or he's not black i can see differences between groups of africans i can see differences between groups of caribbeans and i think everyone can see those differences if they open their eyes to them so this is just me seeing differences between different kind of subgroups of humanity so to speak but anyway just to kind of prove my point so i'm going to zoom in here this is a close-up so you can see over here this is the preserved paint color so that dark brown varnish that is what would have been on the entirety of this statue before so you get a, an idea of what the statue would have looked like and then if you look around the eyes, this is a restored color. So this is something they've come along and they've just basically slapped the black paint back on. 
in order to create this kind of illusion that this was the this is what they were after in terms of a skin tone but you can see here where it's been preserved some of the varnish this is what the original intentional color of the statue was okay so i think this was a good place for us to start because essentially this is we, we need to kind of have that understanding of why there's even a debate when it comes to the color of the or at least the color that they've used in artwork there shouldn't be any debate we shouldn't have this discussion but this is the kind of obfuscation they use in terms of color and data now one of the things that i'm going to show you really quickly just to press home some of that kind of skullduggery <laughs> that they do when it comes to the restoring of um black it was done here on one of these this is a canopic jar from king tutankhamen now have a look at this okay this obviously would have been entirely painted. It's a canopic jar, or canopic face. So um, I'm not sure what the material here would have been. At alabaster, I'm going to assume. I could be wrong. Someone could, um, you know, could correct me on that. Um, Michael, thank you very much, my brother. Oh, I like the way that appears. I haven't even seen that feature. Thank you for the $10. I wish you had left a comment. I really, really appreciate the support. Um, that looks really cool in the screen. <laughs> sorry i'm so excited about this new feature sorry sorry it's, I, I know it's gonna get old <laughs> just bear with me give me give me today give me today to just get over the fact that i can do this now it's been a long time and often thank you very much michael i appreciate it uh, so if you have a look at this stat if, or this um canopic jar you can see that it was all it would have all been faded essentially they, they would have found it with no color on it but somehow miraculously it's got rouge red lips and the black for the eyelids and for the, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, this is ridiculous. The the actual, you know, the, the capresh, the 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 pharaonic headpiece has no colour. The the got even the, the the gold that would have been the you know the falcon and the serpent has rubbed off. Everything in terms of colour has rubbed off, but somehow these blacks have remained on. And if you don't realise how stupid this repainting is. Have a look at this, the, the the snake. Have a look at the serpent. <laughs> look at this preschool paint job that they've done here. I think I've got another angle of it. Do I have another angle? No, there's Raho Tip, which I was going to come on to. Oh, no, I don't. I think I had a front view of it as well somewhere, but I'm not, I can't show it at the moment. But look at the preschool paint job there. It's absolutely ridiculous. So these are the kind of sad things that, you know, Egyptologists do or you know whoever it is the french or the german Egypt, well they're all egyptologists they do to kind of create this illusion or this idea that you know they were trying to present themselves as pale but if you know king tutankhamen he has 400 portraits 400 portraits or portraying him as a little black boy so why would he also just have this canopic jar sitting around where he tried to make himself look ghost white i mean it's absolutely it's so stupid it's so, you know, why are the lips so red? I have no idea. SY, thank you. In fact, because you gave me a $10, in fact, let me just quickly flip that over. Boom. <laughs> and I'll flip your comment on the screen as well. You know, why are the lips so red? God only, well, we know why. We know why. They've done the red, red lips and the, you know, and the black. I mean, it's just, it's just, this is the stupidity that we have to deal with when it comes to their deception. Okay. So a next one that we can have a look at actually, whilst we're on the topic of deception, and once again using the same methods is Rahotep. Now, I've ummed and ahed about, oh, there it is. So this is the other view that I wanted to show you regarding this canopic jar. Have a look at this. Look at this ridiculous preschool paint job that they've done up here. Okay, this is, if you think that this is how they originally looked, I mean, come on, this is just, anyway. I've, I've said enough the point is that these used to have color they don't have any color anymore and they add the black to create a contrast that makes it look deliberate it's just so stupid but i'm going to i'm going to come onto the seated scribe in a moment got to look at rahotep now as well so rahotep i've ummed and ahed about whether or not it's a complete fake so what do i mean why why am i umming and ahring because most people oh it's a fake why are you even bothering the reason i'm umming and ahring is because i think they've used the same technique here I think there's a maybe a possibility that these are genuine statues. Maybe not of Rahotep and Nofret, by the way, but maybe that they're genuine statues and they've once again just used this technique of repainting 
you know, creating their own kind of paint colours. I mean, bear in mind, this is Old Kingdom and look how well preserved, you know, these colours are. You will not find anything Old Kingdom this well preserved. But once again, look at the deep black around the eyes, like I mentioned before. Look at the, the uniformness of this pasty, orangey red colour that is just not consistent with any ancient Kemetic artwork. None whatsoever. You will never see a statue that deliberately has this kind of pasty orange red. And that's not to say, I mean, this colour doesn't exist. I was going to say that's not to say that colour doesn't exist, but this is not a human colour. This is not a human colour. This is not the colour of a person. When Egyptians or Kemetics painted them with a brown red, that is a very human colour. That is a colour that we as Africans know we are familiar with. That is a colour that we all probably have in our households. We all have, we either are that colour or we have relatives who are that colour. Every African you can think of. This colour here, no one really has that colour. This is the colour of sunburn. And this is what makes it so stupid. So I think this is personally a repaint and the reason i think it's a repaint is because feature wise it still doesn't feel far from many africans that i've seen if you look at the side view as well that side view doesn't strike me as you know if i was going to fake a an entire statue as a european i wouldn't i would move further away from an african phenotype than this so to me i feel like it could be repainted I could be wrong, but I feel like it could be repainted. Not that it's important, um, but I feel like it could be repainted, especially since it has, the, you know, the lapis lazuli in the eyes. And that's not an easy, oh, I'm assuming that's not an easy kind of finish to acquire. Um, I could be wrong there, but that's just, that's just me. You know, that's just me thinking there. Okay. Um, so the last fake we're going to look at as well, we're going to, we're going to have to look through a few of these fakes before we look through the real, the real deals. When I say fake, this is not fake, obviously the seated scribe, but the seated scribe I like to bring up a lot because this is another one that this is probably the most famous. <laughs> I think it's in the, someone have a bit of research for me where seated scribe is. I'm guessing it's in the Cairo Museum. I haven't checked out recently. I know, I'm pretty sure it's, it's either in Cairo, but also Louvre, the Louvre is coming to mind. I can't remember. It's one or the other. So please someone tell me where the seated scribe is situated. Um... Yeah, so it's either in Cairo or it's in the um, Louvre Muse Museum. I can't remember which one. But if you, uh, the reason I'm going down to the knees is you can see once again here, down here is where the original colour is. So you can see that dark brown, that intentional colour that this was supposed to be, that brown, dark brown red or that deep brown red. You can see it around the fingers as well here. You can see it here. Okay, this is the intentional colour. Now, the problem is the intentional colour here to the Egyptologists has been treated as though it's dirt. So they've scrubbed off. If you have a look at the, the version that is actually in whichever museum it is now. I, don't, I can't confirm because no one's, no one's told me exactly where it is yet. But wherever it's sitting now, I know that they've scraped all of this colour off the knees. And they just basically, once again, giving you this kind of, you know, European sunburnt red, which was never the intention. I mean, why would you intentionally scrape off remaining paint unless you were trying to create something that doesn't exist or trying to create a view or an image of the ancient Kemetic society that didn't exist? Once again, if you look closely, you can see the, you know, restoration of the colour around the eyes. And, you know, it's just... The tampering is just, it's out of this world. So in, when it comes to, and, and, and the, the, the irony is the seated scribe doesn't even have a name. So people, you know, people put a lot of, you know, <laughs> Egyptologists put so much weight on this. It's particularly the, um, the Egyptian antiquities. They, they worship this seated scribe, this nameless seated scribe. <laughs> we don't know who he is. We don't know where he's from he's not we don't know if he's of royal lineage we know nothing about him we just know there's a nice statue of a seated scribe and praise the lord he looks like he could pass for a modern egyptian so he is going to become the face they even i can't remember i was i think i was doing a live stream someone put this up they even have him on the um um egyptian currency 
He's he was literally on the Egyptian currency. They put him on, you know, forget <laughs> Amenhotep the third, forget, you know, genuine Egyptian rulers. Yeah. Let's put the nameless seated scribe on our currency because he looks like he could pass for one of us. That's basically what they're saying. That's the desperation. So it's almost in that act, they're admitting the fact that there's very few artifacts that actually resemble them. And most of the artifacts actually resemble Africans, actually resemble the Nubians who are, who, who are part of the nation that are cast aside, actually resemble the Nile Valley Africans that are all around them. And they find it really, really hard to accept that fact. So, yeah, um, this is this is the seated scribe. Like I said, we don't know who he is. Um, it's just a statue of someone. You know, the irony is, regardless of the fact that you can see from his knees and his hands that he's supposed to be darker skinned. The, the issue is we don't know who this guy is or where he's from. He could he could have been a visitor from all we know. He could have been a visitor from Babylon. <laughs> you know, he could have been a visitor from anywhere who, who decided he was going to study the comedic ways. We just don't know anything about him. That's the irony of that's the irony of it. Like, come on, if you're gonna put someone in your currency, at least have some context in regards to who that person is, you know. But anyway, that's that. We've we've done we've done that to death now. Let's 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 move on. Let's move on. So I want to go through and let's let's really dissect and really unwrap this kind of the colour of the comedics. In fact, before we um I'm gonna just quickly pull a picture up. Yep. And we'll come to it in a minute. But I want us to just quickly have a quick exploration into pigment and how pigment was used and where pigment came from. So I found this really cool website which actually talks about the different pigments that are used in Kemet. And I think it would be good just to kind of have a quick read through together because um, it's quite interesting. So here, just, I'm just going to read from here, pigments in Egyptian art. Onto the base ochre colours. Egyptians added dark and light blues, greens, violet, white, and gold to the palette. Where did Egyptians get most of their pigments? Most of the pigments in Egypt were derived from local minerals. Okay, so that's quite important to know. White from gypsum, black from carbon, reds and yellows from ochre containing iron oxides. Okay. Some reds from Rialgar, uh, sulfide of arsenic used today to give the red color in some fireworks blue and green from azurite and malachite blue from atasamite or atacamite i'm not sure hydrated copper chloride bright yellow representing gold from or piment another sulfide of arsenic pale yellow from jarosites a mineral containing sulfates of iron and potassium and some of the, so um, I think that's it. So I, I could talk about this, but we're going to go through the Nemum portraits in a little bit. But the point being is that one of the things that stood out to me here is that in terms of the Kemetic or the Egyptian palette, it's not like going into your local, you know, paper chase or your local kind of art shop, art depot and just having carte blanche of every single colour under the sun. They, they had certain deposits and certain, you know, um, a limited number of colour resource available to them. So this, to me, somewhat may contribute to the choice of red being used so much in the tone, getting as close to the skin tone, but bearing in mind that there might be limitations in regards to how much of a certain mixture of a certain tone they can produce you know was brown achieved by simply mixing the black from the carbon with the red we had like a maybe a dark red add a bit of yellow to get the brown can you see what i mean the the, the mixing had to be something that was considered or taken into consideration so when i read this it was quite enlightening for me just to bear in mind that obviously they had the same limitations as we do today now I'm an art student as well, not not of recent, but, you know, I'm an art student as well. And I know that obviously the three primary colours, red, yellow, 
blue will essentially give you every color under the sun. So I'm not for by by any means suggested that they weren't able to, you know, acquire or make a certain tone. But what I am suggesting is that it seems they had a lot. And we know from actually African culture <laughs> that red ochre is one of the most abundant minerals and it's used so much it's used by the himba people it's used by the omo people in their hair it's just it, red ochre is everywhere so you can imagine how much you know given that that was so abundant that it would it would have been used and perhaps overused in the culture so that's just something just to bear in mind by the way i'm not saying the red red color wasn't accurate but it's just maybe something to kind of take into consideration because i found that quite um yeah, I found that quite intriguing. But anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. So I just want to go through that. I also, the other thing that I want to point out as well is bright yellow here representing gold from Orpiment. Remember, that yellow color or that bright yellow color is sometimes used on female goddesses and then later used by kind of Egyptologists, Eurocentric Egyptologists, I should say, to kind of suggest that, oh, you know, look, yellow skinned female, that was the color of the, and it's like, no, that was probably an attempt to create gold. And what we're seeing is the yellow remnants of something that was trying to create a gold color. We know that essentially every single um, sarcophagus had a um, gold mask as a part of it. So, you know, the, the overuse of gold or the use of gold was certainly very much an everyday thing when it came to, rep particularly if people were in the, anyone who was um, a priestess of ha of Heteru or a priest of, of, of Hathor at some point would have had a portrait or a representation done in the gold that Heteru was represented in. So that's another thing to just kind of like bear in mind as well. So they used that quite a lot. There was, that was used quite heavily. So anyway, let's go through these images. Now, there's a wooden statue here. And one of the reasons why I've shown you this statue, I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a load, by the way. We're gonna go through a load. But one of the things that I noted is that wood tends to preserve color better than stone, or obviously stele. So stele is obviously stone walls. So with the stone walls, they would use plaster normally on top of the, whatever the base, color of that wall or so whatever the base material of that wall was they would normally do a layer of plaster and then apply the colors so the only thing is the colors didn't hold very well however the wooden statues tend to preserve color really really well and you're going to see that and that's hopefully going to remove some of the mysticism behind this apparent red color that seems to you know be very very common in kemetic art have a look at this statue here okay have a look at this statue here look at the color okay this is clearly a deep brown okay it's a very very deep brown now you have to ask yourself if this was painted on a wall where the color wasn't held so well as it is on a statue how would this natural brown have translated and before you kind of suggest that well this is just a, a one-off they're not the statues aren't all like this actually you'll find a majority of kemetic wooden statues so statues and statuettes tend to hold the dark brown really well and i'm actually going to prove that point as well when we look at nebum sorry nebum as well because that's i'm going to use that to drive this point home so just bear with me we're going to come on to that so please do not tune out because we're gonna we're gonna really touch on the how, the use of color today um i've shown this one this one's obviously the natural wood color but you can see even the difference between the tunic and the back but i'm gonna quickly just flip over to this one now this one i included because i thought it was really important to include it so this one you can see is a lighter color okay so this one's a lighter color and initially I thought, okay, maybe it's changed. But then I had quite a close inspection. And unless someone's gone in literally with a, <laughs> unless someone's gone in literally with sandpaper 
and removed every trace. I couldn't find much evidence of dark pigment. But then I had a double take and I was just like, <laughs> how many Africans do you know with this skin tone? Loads. <laughs> I just look, I took a step back and I was like, wait a second, he looks, <laughs> he looks like my Igbo brethren, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so once again, going back on the idea that the ancient Kemites were accurate with their color. We must not become monolithic in our viewpoint as well. That's really important. We mustn't have this idea, you know, in Metatron's video, um, he talks about the fact that, you know, the Egyptians standardized their color and then they used one tone of red and brown for everybody in Kemet because everybody was the same. I'm like, listen, miss me with that nonsense. Yeah, anyone who's African will tell you, don't try and use one colour to represent any African nation. We have so much diversity, even within our households, it's impossible that that is anywhere near the truth. The truth of an African household is that you're going to have some people that look like brother over here. <laughs> you're going to have some people that look like this dude over here. And they're going to be siblings. And they're going to be cousins. So actually, when I looked at this one, initially, I was looking for skullduggery. And I actually looked, took a step back and thought, okay, Matt, it might have lightened a bit, but I'm happy to, you know, concede that this is a natural color. This is a natural skin tone. This is a represented, represented skin tone that you will see in Africa. What I'm not happy to do is accept that that pasty red that you see on the seated scribe is a natural skin tone because it isn't. And this is the difference. Okay, so I'm quite happy with this one. I think, yeah, looks cool. Look at the hair. This is a bra. <laughs> look at me, look. Like, regardless of this being light, are you, I mean, are you really going to try and claim this if you're not an African? Are you really going to try and say this is a portrayal of some kind of a European or an Arab? Because I ain't seeing it. I don't know. I could be blind. I could be blind. But anyway, let's move on. So you can see here, once again, what I was talking about the representation of the differences in tonality that you get, okay? A darker skinned brother and two, I wouldn't say, I wanna say lighter skinned brothers. Now, the only thing that I will say about this one is once again, I have a feeling that some of the, there's been some restoration work with these two. Why do I say that? It's the deepness of the black. Black, if you look at the artworks I'm about to show you, Black is normally the first color to go, particularly on the head of these statuettes. So you'll see it will normally start to kind of fade around the crown. And this one just looks a bit too deep. So I feel like there may have been some tampering here. I feel like this, this once again, it's that illusion of contrast that I was talking to you about earlier. So just bear in mind that illusion of contrast. So what, do, what do I mean? If you make, if you have a faded statue and you restore the blacks and you make the blacks black, it makes the skin appear lighter. Whereas if you just leave it all faded, then on a subconscious level, you look at it and it just all appears like a faded statue. Does that make sense? So this is the only thing I have slight suspicions about this one, but still not outside of the range of what I would consider normal on the African continent. So I've done that brother already. Now, some of you will probably recognize this one. This is a more famous one, or at least it should be a famous one. Perhaps it isn't a famous one. We've got back view here. We're about to get front view. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to tell me who this guy is. I'm going to put them on the screen. I'm going to see if anyone knows. Thank you, Stephanie, so much for your donation. I appreciate you. Thank you for your hard work. Please keep, these, please keep up these crucial investigations. I absolutely will. So I've put the... Um, I really appreciate that donation as well. It's very generous of you. Um, I've put that on the screen now and I'm waiting for people to give me some feedback about who this statue is. I'm hoping that everyone knows, or at least someone knows, not everyone. So this is, Sen I hope I get this right now. This is Senusret the first, I think. Yes, this is the th Senusret the first because there's another statue of Senusret the second that looks very, very similar to it. But this is Senusret the first. So this is um, Middle Kingdom, 12th dynasty, I believe, Sinistret the first. And once again, just have a look at this statue here, okay? Look at the kind of 
beautiful naturalistic tone. Now, obviously, we know this one's weathered as well, so there could have been a lot of fade in here, but we do have at least a preservation. Now, I'm going to just quickly zoom in, okay? Remember what I was telling you earlier? Have a look around his eyes. What do you, what do you notice that's missing that was on the statue of the seated scribe, that was on the statue of Rahotep, that was on that first statue? What do you notice that's missing from this one? Yeah, so it's the eyeliner, okay? It hasn't been restored. You can see this is the natural fading that should take place. This is a untouched statue, okay? This one hasn't been touched in any way, shape or form. And you can see, like I suggested earlier, that color will fade before the tonality of the skin fades. It absolutely will fade, okay? So that's just proof of how they tampered those other statues by bringing back color that doesn't need to essentially be there, okay? So you can see it there. So this is Sinistret the first, looking typically African. Um, hit the likes up, by the way, guys. Um, oh, by the way, he's wearing the crown of Lower Kemet there. And I think what's really interesting about this crown, because I was doing some research as well, this is very, very similar this crown here, the only place I've seen anything like this restored. Does anyone know what country has a, a crown that's very similar to the crown of Lower Kemet? And it's also similar to the crown of Nefertiti. Does anyone know which which country has that or which um, ethnicity has that? Just feel free to, to jump in if you if you got an answer to that. I know there's a little bit of delay probably with me asking the questions and the chat responding because there's probably going to be some kind of a a delay between a live stream. Yeah, Miss KK, I'm just gonna quickly put that comment on the screen. They even broke the nose on the tiny statues. <laughs> Isn't it sad? Isn't it sad? Literally all of the, you know, and you can see here, you know what's interesting about this? You can see how the lips were damaged when they were striking or when they were sanding down Look, that's been sanded down, okay? And people gonna turn around and tell you that this is iconoclasm and all this baloney about them not wanting, you know, other pharaohs coming along and not wanting the old pharaohs to breathe. I mean, it's absolute bullcock. You can see what's going on here, okay? And I would put, I would, you know, give my right arm that this is obviously recent damage done by Europeans. Um, so this is um, South Africa. Thank you, Joy. That was the answer I was looking for. Zulu people of South Africa. Yes, it's an Nguni. It's an Nguni crown or hat, I should say. I think it's called the basket. I think it's called a basket hat. I could be wrong. Feel free to correct me on that. But I think it's called an Nguni basket hat. But please do correct me in the comments if you know what the name of it is. But it, it conforms to this exact shape. It's the only thing that I've seen that conforms to a shape like this. So it's just really interesting to note. Um, someone said Uganda or Rwanda I see that definitely in the, in the well I see that in the phenotype I'm not sure if you're talking about the hat as well maybe they have it in Uganda or Rwanda as well but I certainly see Uganda or Rwanda in Sinistret's phenotype here um, let's move on so this oh sorry I maybe got it wrong this is Sinistret the second because this one is Sinistret the first <laughs> because they both look really similar but apparently it's different. So this is Sinistret the first. So that was Sinistret the second. This is Sinistret the first. And he's wearing the crown of upper Kemet here. You know what's really hilarious about this? So before I kind of go on about this one is I was looking at descriptions online, the kind of descriptions that they, they use for this in the museums. And one of the things they say about this statue is that this is a statue of Sinistret the first but it's not in his likeness and the reason they say this is not in his likeness listen to this the reason they say it's not in his likeness is because apparently he's wearing a divine kilt <laughs> so it's, it's the same thing they do with the funerary guards you know of king tut the ones that are jet black oh this is not really a portrait of king tut because they're funerary guards they said, this is not a likeness of King Sinistret I because he's wearing a divine kilt. And a divine kilt proves that this was just a representation of a god, you know, in the form of Sinistret. So this is not really... 
This is the kind of stupidity that they come out with. Why do you think they've got an issue with this being a representation? Why do they think they're trying to make it divine? Because essentially they're trying to explain away the dark skin. If they say, oh, it's divine, they can say, oh, well, you know, the dark skin was just a representation of divinity. It's not really what his skin color looked like. He's wearing the crown of Upper Regent, for goodness sake. He's not wearing an Osirian crown. He's not wearing the the beard that they wear to kind of depict the divinity. This is as portrait as you will ever get in Kemet. This is literally what he would have walked around looking like most days. And yet they found a way of disconnecting this portrait from his likeness. That's how ridiculous they are with it. Okay, they are utterly ridiculous with it. So anyway, this is a, a portrait of Sinister the First. And once again, like I said to you before, the wood really does hold on to the colour much better than the um, Stele, than the Stele artworks that we normally see in Kemet. Let me move on. So this is another view of what I believe to be the same image. Let me just double check. It's like it is the same statue. I'm just looking at the hand. Sometimes you've got two really similar statues and they're not the same. But yeah, that's the same. So this is the same statue front on. And I think we saw this statue before. Why? What did I want to bring up that was really relevant of this? Oh yeah, so... um. Here's some other ones. Now have a look at the color here. This is what I really, I've got, I think I've got a closer up of this one. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to this one because we can go to that. So you can see here the reddish brown. This I believe is more often than not the target color of most comedic artwork. Okay, it's a strong reddish brown. Okay, you can see it here. And it kind of comes onto the subject of undertones that I wanted to bring up as well. So this is this is kind of another discussion that perhaps only people who have who are familiar sometimes we as Africans we really do take for granted some of the things that we've been exposed to because genuinely and I say this I say this with all genuity genu genuinely because of the way kind of the caste system has played itself through society a lot of Europeans when they think of black people irrespective of seeing us and having interaction with us they just they actually do think of the color black and i know that sounds really bizarre but it's absolutely true they actually do think of the color black and so whenever they see something that's not black in antiquity they think that all black people came from this black monolithic race that were jet black and anyone who exists now who exhibits tones of brown has basically mixed it's come as a result of mixing with the europeans that's what the perspective is of most people. That's and actually, I, I think there's some. There'll be some melanated people who buy into that as well. Who believe, you know, you know, any light skinned or any kind of like medium toned people within their family are remnants of some kind of European intermixture. It's it's a it's a story that's kind of embedded itself into us because of what we've been taught about our history. In reality, we know that. All skin tones, all tones of black have existed for the longest time. Okay, all tones, or I say black, all tones of brown, all tones of melanation have existed for the longest time through history. So this reddish brown, I believe, is the target colour for most comic artwork, including the stellies that we see. It's just simple that a lot of the time the dark pigment that sits on top doesn't survive because the red is often used as the undertone and this is this image i thought was a really good portrayal of that have a look at this image and let me see if i, can, I can't zoom in anymore so if you can see it clearly on the screen you can see that it appears to me that the base color here was a, a reddish tone and the finishing color as you can see around the joints here was the darker tone and what happens a lot of the time is the darker tone doesn't preserve but the red undertone preserves much better so the red undertone to some degree is because it's placed first is the one that seeps into the material and we're left with its remnants but then the dark overtone just like we saw with the seated scribe on his knees when we were looking at that earlier that dark tone doesn't survive it's the red undertone that survives and i think this is a really good portrayal 
of what the target tone is a lot of times. So a lot of time people see that kind of like little flex of red paint. It's like, are they trying to paint red people? It's like, I don't see that. I don't, I don't think they're trying to paint red people. I think they're trying to get this deep reddish brown. Um, this is obviously a really good example of it. This is a statuette of Wa. Okay, you can find this one on the net. This is a lovely example. And actually on this note of statuettes, wooden statuettes, there are literally hundreds of these, maybe even thousands of them. I'm actually going to show you during this little presentation some pictures that I took whilst I was at the British Museum. Like I said, they all preserve their colour really well. So it kind of raises this question where you have to have this discussion. Okay, you have to have this discussion. Why are all of the statuettes brown or reddish brown yet the stele art is a lot of it is reddish brown to be honest with you but the stele art is this faded kind of reddish brown sometimes bordering on red why do we have a, a difference if we're essentially portraying the same people or the same group of people why are all the statuettes brown because one of the things Egyptologists can't argue with that they haven't done a very good job at giving you a bunch of red statuettes. All ancient Kemetic statuettes look like this guy. They look brown. They they preserve that skin tone. This guy is literally my exact complexion. <laughs> that's literally my exact complexion. Okay, that's not me trying to claim Kemet. I'm just telling you, that's my skin tone. You can't turn around as a modern kind of like, you know, Arab person or European person and say you've ever been this skin tone. You can stand out in the sun for 24, 48, 72, 1,024 hours <laughs> and you will never achieve this skin tone. This is the skin tone I walk around with and many Africans walk around with. And I'm dark skinned, <laughs> you know. So this is just, you know, you have to you have to bear with these kind of like this this very basic logic. OK, before I move on, I'm just going to quickly see if I can dive into some comments because a, a lot of people have been commenting. Um, hit up the likes, by the way, if you haven't. Um, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Um, this is great. This is the first time I caught a live. Great, great work. Thank you very much, Delina. You are very, very welcome here. Um, upper region, uh, da, 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 da. they didn't ship all those people to Brazil. It's the second largest population outside of Africa. I'm not going to go into that right now. There's some good stuff going on, but I'm going to try and keep on topic, otherwise, this is going to go on too late. They were Nubian and Redskin. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Redskin, like well Nubian amongst yeah <laughs> they were African that's the that's the bottom line they had afros they certainly did uh let's go let's go white people red equals brown sorry bear with me I'm just trying to see if there's any comments that I want to pull up um sometimes i have to skip over them because some comments are really good but then they're going to lead me down a rabbit hole that i have no time to complete so i have to ignore them you have to forgive me okay um type of red king jacob north sudanese and southern egyptians in contrast to south sudanese i don't know what that is Okay, there's not a uh, lot of trolls in the chat. Can, yeah, I can see there's a, there's quite a few trolls in the chat, isn't there? Um, the thing is, you know, I've, I've developed quite a fan base and this is the thing, the obsession with my channel um, is something that I'm, you know, I, I literally can't help it. Um, there are quite a few. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I could go in there and I could block the trolls, but I think you guys do a really good job at showing them their ass. So feel free to... to Correct the idiots if you want if you want to. I don't think it actually requires my input. I haven't seen anyone here that you guys can't handle. <laughs> so I'm gonna move on. So this is why, like I said, who basically is like I said, is is the complexion of more darker skinned Africans. I'm gonna move on. And this is the thing. Going back to that as well, I acknowledge the fact that I'm dark skinned. And I also acknowledge the fact that dark skinned is not the probably not the dominant phenotype, particularly to, you know, diaspora Africans. Okay, maybe to you know certain parts of africa it is but it's not necessarily the dominant phenotype the dominant phenotype actually in a lot of you know particularly diaspora africans is medium brown is that kind of like the reddish brown that the ancient egyptians so it's like it's almost like a lot of black people sometimes cannot see themselves unless the statue is really dark 
and like going back to that statue I showed you before that kind of had that kind of um, brownie with a yellowish undertone look to it. And I said, look, that's a, that's a, that's a black guy. I know that there have been a few people on this chat who are going to struggle with that. They're going to struggle with that. They're going to struggle with seeing an African in that color. And you have to question, well, why is that the case? Why can't you see yourself in a medium toned African why does it have to be really, really dark? It's just a question, isn't it? It's just something to kind of, you know, just to consider and to ponder. Okay, here's another one. Once again, statuettes showing that reddish brown color. There's so many of these, by the way. I could literally do this all day. There's war again. This is a slightly different statue, but once again, look at the skin tone. Okay, that's the deliberate skin tone. Okay, very little fading going on here. This is another very, very beautiful statue. This one has a reddish undertone as well. So going back to that red undertone, you can kind of see it peeking through. So you've got the kind of the darkness of certain parts of the lens. But then you look at the realism is that the beauty behind this one, actually, is that look how much it looks like real skin. It has that genuine kind of glow that African skin has. It's not just like they've got a single pasty color. You can see the attempt at realism in putting that undertone and then darkening certain parts it really is a beautiful statue um and it's good to kind of like appreciate how good the ancient Kamaic artwork was but just look at that look at the african hairstyle come on come on people okay another beautiful piece of artwork and like i said they could do this all day all ancient Kamaic statuettes have preserved the dark brown color and for those of you who say, oh, well, that's the colour of the wood. It wasn't deliberate. Well, the hair colour is deliberate. The loincloth is deliberate. Why would the body not be deliberate? You know, you have to ask yourself that question. But that's a lovely statue there. Um, another one. This one's a really good portrayal, actually. It's a statue of Minhotep. If you zoom in here. You can see once again what I'm talking about in terms of the undertone of red. So you have the undertone of red and then you have that kind of brown sitting on top. And I think it's a culmination of the two. I think when you're painting African people, you, you have to start with an undertone. You can't just kind of slap a uniform color on there. You have to start. And I, I guess if I zoom in the face, it, it gives you a better, a better idea of what I'm talking about. So you can see in some of these crevices where the dark brown has kind of, it kind of sits in. Okay, so you kind of see it there. This is, it's a common thing that happens when you're varnishing that, you know, the crevices will preserve the color better than the actual, um, the flat surfaces will, which obviously will just kind of like, but let's have a look at that. That's a, a really beautiful statue. Okay, I don't think this one has actually suffered much fading i think this one's looking probably very close to what it looked like when it was created and once again if you look at that tone it's just a tone of africans okay um more statues there, okay? They're all the same. And this is the thing, when people are kind of like sitting there pondering, wondering, <laughs> battling, you know? Someone said, uh, Minotep looks like, looks Horn of Africa. In fact, he looks like my cousin. Let's go back to that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. He has a very, you know, he has a very Somali look. Very, very Somali look there. Very Somali look there. I definitely see. I definitely see that, particularly in that one. There's something about that, the way the features fall together in this one. I can I can see that. Can absolutely see that. Once again, a really beautiful statue here. And once again, it's just consistent along these statuettes. The preservation of color, and this should once again raise that question mark. Okay, it should really raise that question mark about what was the goal when you see red stele arts. Now, I could go through loads and loads of these, but I want to kind of move on to the stele art now 
because I think that's an important discussion for us to have. This is a really good statue here. Have a look at this one. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna move up because I don't want to get blocked. I don't want my live stream to get blocked, please. <laughs> okay, but this is a beautiful one as well. Look at this statue of this brother. This is African brother striding around, <laughs> letting it all hang out. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Um, even this one here, where it's you know obviously considerably damaged you can still see the preservation okay where with the wood is a little bit difficult a little bit more difficult to get that kind of well basically it's a bit more difficult to hide what was initially there but remember what i said about the hair as well so remember what i was talking to you guys earlier about the hair have a look at the hair here it's basically gray so you can see when you have a, a faded statue normally if the entire statue is faded, the hair takes a hit. You get this kind of like grayness and this patchiness on the crown. So when you have a look at some of those statues and the, the hair is just literally block black and the statue's faded, you can have a fair guess that it's been tampered with. Okay. So that's just a, a little bit of an illustration of that there. So there's that brother. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't mean to. That's that brother again. Like I said, with that kind of sandy tone, which isn't, like I said, is not, there's nothing strange about that, looking at that. There's nothing strange about that to me. Now, I'm trying to remember. These are Nubians. They are. I was trying to remember exactly where they're from. These are a couple of Nubian sisters. And, you know, look at the skin, okay? And then, for instance, I could even look at this as a reference statue. Look at that as a lighter one. I look at the skin of this sister over here, okay? Red undertone is so common in Nubia. It's so common. And you shouldn't have to go that far afield. That's the bottom line. You should not have to go that far afield to find the phenotypes that are literally on display in Kemetic artwork, okay? It's an African civilization and the Africans are literally all around. You don't have to fly, hop on a jet or even skip across the Red Sea to find the people. That's another Nubian sister, I believe. I think I included this because people like to make a big deal about the lapis lazuli as though, you know, first of all, I don't believe the use of lapis lazuli was to suggest that the person had blue eyes. I believe the use of lapis lazuli in the eyes is because it was a very precious stone. Okay, and it made the eyes look alive. If you look at one of those statues with lapis lazuli, they literally look like living statues because the eyes sparkle very similar to human eyes so you actually look like it looks when you look at one of those statues it looks like you're looking at someone that's living more than if the color has literally just been painted on with paint so this is one of the reasons why lapis lazuli was used in the eyes but if you believe that it's a representation of them having blue eyes it doesn't necessarily mean well it's necessarily it doesn't at all mean that they were black-skinned europeans okay so just you know get that <laughs> get that in, get that out of your head if you if you're thinking that now many of you will be familiar with these portraits this is these are from the Nebamum, i believe actually were these from the Nebamum or was this horror now this is Nebamum. this is from Nebamum. and why am i including this okay i'm gonna like, hit you with a little bit of a okay so just bear with me okay you've got the Nebamum here and we can look at this, even this skin tone, which is, you know, had some, I mean, I've seen the Nebuman portraits. They're actually on um, display in the British Museum. They're actual, they've actually taken the walls out and they're there. I asked the curator. I hope I'm right, by the way, because I, I was told by the curator that the, um, the stele of Ramesses, where he's battling the Nubians, I was told that was genuine. And I found out after I did my video that it was based on, um, based on a stele that's in Upper Egypt somewhere. I think it's Deir El Bilal, something like that. I can't remember. But it's based on another stele that doesn't have any colour on it, which really irritated me because I did a whole video on it. <laughs> and now I have to revise that video, which really annoys me. The, the, the point remains, but the point is I have to now redo that video because I was told something incorrect by a curator. But a curator also told me that 
the Nebbermann portraits that are in the British Museum are the actual walls of Nebbermann. They've actually taken them off and they, they're hanging in British Museum. So feel free to correct me if I'm right or if I'm wrong, but that's what I've been told by the curator. So I've seen it and it genuinely is this colour. Okay, so this isn't, a lot of time you see stuff online and it's been Photoshopped lighter or Photoshopped darker, depending on which side of the fence is shown it, if you know what I mean. If the Eurocentrists are showing it, they Photoshopped it, they made it lighter, as you'll see with a lot of mummies photos. Um, and sometimes the reverse is done. Okay, but this is the genuine colour. I've seen the Nebelman portraits and this is literally what they look like. Okay, so they have this kind of like tonality to them. Now, even with this tonality, we can look at that and we can say, well, those are just, those are, those are, those are Africans. Okay. This is a lot of Ethiopians, even the hair, everything about this just has a very kind of, a lot of people will say horn of Africa phenotype to it, but it's either way, it's an African phenotype, either which way. But we're going to come on to it because there is a but. So once again, that color is coming through there. So that's quite a strong kind of almost deliberate kind of red. Okay. So bear with me. It's like a reddish kind of, once again, quite quite similar to modern day Nubians. So, yeah, let's keep flicking through. And there's Nebamum and his wife. Okay, Nebamum, his wife, his child. Okay, bear this in mind. Bear this in mind, because this is literally the color it is. Like I said, this isn't. This is a little bit lighter. This picture that I found. I've actually got photographs. So it's a little bit darker than this, but not much. Not much. So it has this kind of like this kind of pasty-ish red. And my suspicion is obviously when I was seeing that, I was like, it looks faded. Because even if you look at the bottom portion of his daughter over here, you can see it's a bit darker. So something's gone on to fade the overall look of it. But I'm not going to like reach too much. I'm going to just say it looks genuinely, generally a little bit faded. But I can't, but it, it, it basically doesn't have the, certainly doesn't have the depth and the vibrancy that it probably would have when it was created. Okay. Now, what am I moving on to here? Okay, because I need you to, to to stay with me. I'm moving. I'm, go, I'm going somewhere with this. This is a statue of Nebuchadnezzar and his wife. Okay, this is a statue of Nebuchadnezzar and his wife. What do you notice is the difference? There's a huge difference here in the tonality that has been used in this statue of Nebuchadnezzar and his wife, and the stele of Nebuchadnezzar and his wife. Okay, huge differentiation there. And you can see this is deliberate because they're wearing white tunics. Okay, <laughs> no one's poured black ink over this. This dark color that you see here, this very deep brown, is the color that was chosen for the statue. Yet this is the color of Nebamum in the stele. And to me, this was, when I saw this, this was quite a big revelation to me. Because I was like, well, look, Nebman portraits are some of the most well-preserved stele artworks. And they depict all of the people in this kind of very reddish brown tone, which we take for granted. We say, oh, well, they must have been that reddish brown. But then when you see his statue, his statue is a very deep brown, a very deep deep dark brown a very deep dark african brown not that the, the reddish brown isn't dark but it raises the question which is the deliber deliberate color okay which is the deliberate color so then that once again leans towards my thesis my theory that these are maybe missing a top layer you know missing some kind of they're missing some kind of depth. I'm not going to suggest that the Nebman portraits have been tampered because I, I don't know here, I'm, I'm neither which way I mean, I'm going to zoom in close on it. It doesn't, I mean, that black there does look a bit sus. I'm not going to lie. Can you see that black portion around here? That looks a bit sus. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Remember what I said about the restoring of the black? Um, in fact, one of the things I never touched on, and actually this is quite important. One of the things I never touched on, this is really important. The going back to, and I, 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 yeah, let me go back to it. Got one of the things I never touched on is going back to Rahotep really quickly. So going back to Rahotep because we did touch on him really quickly, and I think it's worth the <laughs> the hieroglyphs around Rahotep are definitely fake. Okay, so I know a lot of people will go, "Oh, it has this cartouche." This I've never seen. 
you know, hieroglyphic inscriptions that look like this before. This just looks like a preschool. They're not even uniform. There's no, it doesn't feel, look like there's any attempt at stenciling here and they're jet black just drawn on. And I can't think of where that has been done anywhere in ancient Kemetic history where the cartouche has not been inscribed. It's just been painted on in black paint that has somehow survived for 5,000 years without, look at this, this literally like looks like it's been painted yesterday. Do you understand? So this is absolutely ridiculous. You know, this is absolutely ridiculous. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of like point that out, you know, in terms of the tampering of the works, it really is widespread and quite rife. So going back, um, where were we? So I'm just trying to find my Rahotep again. Yeah, so my statue of Rahotep, that was one, so not of, of Nebamum, I wanted to show you just to kind of push that point that what we're seeing on the walls was not necessarily what was targeted, okay? This is the, looks like it was the target color. So there you go. That's just one for you to kind of like bear in mind. These pictures I took myself. I remember I said about the consistency of Kemetic statuettes, okay? These are very deep brown, okay? When you see them, it looks a little bit light in the photo, but that's kind of like my camera lens, not dealing with the colors that well. These are just basically deep brown, not very far from my skin tone, if I'm going to be totally honest with you. And that's me being totally honest, not, not exaggerating at all, okay? This is kind of what they look like when, you, when you're not that close up. And I've got loads of these images, and they're all the same. Once again, whole villages of Kemetic people, all in deep brown, none of them in that bright red. So you can see this whole idea, this whole kind of like gnosis behind the fact that, you know, they were red. It doesn't exist when you look at the statuettes. All the statuettes of ancient Kemetic people, when they're in villages, when they show them, when they're shown on mass, you've probably seen the archers, the um, portrait of the Kemetic. No, sorry, they. You had the you have the Tarsetian archers, but also you have the um, Egyptian um, infantry. So if you've seen the statuettes of the Egyptian infantry, they are all a deep brown. It's like there's no question mark about what they are there's no question mark about what was trying to be portrayed there okay once again i'm just zooming here these are others that this is once again all in the british museum look at that deep brown there okay that is the target color the red undertone you can see the deep brown okay so you can see the target color here was always brown okay the target color was never red all right, I'm going to do a little bit of looking and cleaning up in the comments here. See what's going on. Uh, oh, my goodness, there's a lot going on here, isn't there? Blimey. All right, just bear with me. I'm going to try and get through these comments, or at least. Uh, Bear with me. Sorry, guys, just bear with me as I quickly have a look through these comments. Get the lights up, by the way. They f they appear to have frozen a little bit. Hit the lights up. We'll be wrapping up this soon, to be honest with you. We haven't got that much more to cover. I think we've looked at quite a lot of artworks. I don't see that many. I'm looking for the trolls. I'm definitely going to need to assign some moderators, by the way. So I think um, I'll reach out to people. Um, definitely people who, are, who I know I can trust who've been here for a little while and give some moderator access so you can block trolls if they are causing problems, definitely. All right, there's not a huge amount, huge amount going on that I really need to please here. So I'm going to move on. All right, so 
you can see the statuettes there once again. And I know this might seem like I'm kind of like, I hope it doesn't feel like I'm teaching people to suck eggs here, but there's such a preponderance of ancient Kemet artwork just showing that they were, it was, they were brown. <laughs> you know, they were a deep brown, not a, a tanned red, not a light brown, but they, you know, they, it was a deep brown. That was the color that they were going for. So it might feel like I'm just kind of going over and over this, but it's because don't blame me, blame the fact that 99% of this Egyptian, ancient Egyptian statuettes look like this. That's not, that's not my fault. Okay. It's not my fault. They wanted to look African for some strange reason. Okay. That's not my fault. That's their fault. Blame them. This is one and I've included this deliberately. Okay. Slightly lighter. All right. Once again, question mark. Why am I, someone tell me why am I dubious about this one? Someone tell me why am I dubious? I'm going to leave it on there. And if someone gets it right, I'm going to put them on the screen. Why am I dubious? A little bit dubious about this one. I'm not, once again, I'm not saying that this isn't the natural skin tone. This could have been the skin tone of this person. But what is it that makes me dubious about this one in particular? Does anyone know? Welcome, Kelnari. You're late, but you're very welcome. And people don't normally get notifications on my live stream. Does anyone know? Why am I a little bit dubious about this one? I think you guys are a little bit behind me, so I don't mind waiting for a bit till I get the answer. Is there hundreds of trolls? I'm not seeing it all. There we go. Got to put it on the screen. Okay. Thank you. All right. Musicologist got it in one. Okay. It's the hair. Look at the hair. It's just so deep. Look at the hair of all these people. Okay. And look at the hair here. That deep black, it just looks a little, I'm just a little bit dubious. Okay, once again, I feel like it could have been, you know, just touched once again. It just increases the contrast. Once again, I'm not, I'm not for, at one point suggesting that this wasn't the target color. Okay, it could be. It could very well be the target color. Once again, we're not dealing with monoliths here. A majority of people looking African does not exclude that some people might have been very, very light skinned or fair skinned or very, yeah, very, very light skinned or even might have been, you know, there might have been some people who were <laughs> not black. OK, it is possible. It is possible. But what we're talking about is the the normality of what was it that w of what people were faced with. OK, remember, black people are not Africans, I should say, are not exclusivist. OK, anyone can come from anywhere. Anyone could have come from any part of the world at any given moment in time and decided, you know, they want to set up a shop in Nubia, Kemet, and they would have been welcomed with open arms because of the nature of Africans. So just bear that in mind, okay? I'm going to move on. Same. Look at this entire village here, okay? All African coloured, okay? Took this video. Getting these images wasn't easy. These are once again images that I got whilst I was at the British Museum. You can see them all, okay? You literally can see them all. Clearly a, a patrol that you could see in any African vision, um, any African village at any time. Literally any African village at any time you can see this. More of the same. Okay, I don't know why that's included there. Why do I include that? I tried to stay on point here. So then I've moved on to some steles, okay? Um, and really just to kind of like, see if we can tie down where this um, red, this idea of the Egyptians being kind of a red race came from. So I believe this is from the tomb of the, no the, tomb of the nobles in Thebes, I believe. Yeah, I believe this is from the tomb of the nobles in Thebes, once again. You know, this is the kind of image that, you know, Eurocentrists would kind of flash up and then say, yes, the red skin, and then let's skip over it really, really quickly. Let's not, let's not skip over it. Let's zoom in. Let's have a look at the hair texture. Okay. Let's look at the hairstyle. Does that look like something? Did they, is that, does that look deliberate or accidental that they've shown the hair texture there on both of these? The hairstyle, the comedic twists. Does that look deliberate or accidental to you? because it looks very deliberate to me. 
And this is the point. These are just upper Egyptians doing their thing, upper Kemites doing their thing. Once again, there you go, that reddish color, but this one's preserved some of its brown. So you can kind of see it there. It's just a reddish brown of about, I would say, 40% of Africans. 40% <laughs> of Africans. This brother looks like he might have dreadlocks, okay, or long twists, I should say, that are kind of in that process. And by the way, I did mention at the start, if you're just joining, you might have missed, but I did mention at the start that I'm doing a video about hair that's coming really soon. It's kind of based around Kweeti, but it's talking about basically how a lot of Africa, I've learned so much about hair, by the way, so I'm going to do some experimentation with my daughter's hair. <laughs> but a lot of African societies, particularly around the Nilo Saharan, Chadic society, Sudanese society, they have all of these really interesting methods for growing really long hair really really long hair using these kind of like these mixtures that they've kind of created and i didn't know any of this existed but these are ancient mixtures and i believe a lot of this you know if you've looked at the the short twist for instance um east africans tend to achieve this hairstyle by using this kind of butter milk you see the afar people use kind of butter and they'll twist it around a stick and but there's so much more that goes into the different hairstyles so I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on how they achieve kind of like this length because it actually it's not like it's a dead culture it's something that is being practiced in Africa to this day by lots and lots of African groups like I said in in Chad it's it's it's, it's practiced quite heavily where the women will grow unbelievably long hair you know right down to their hips and it's, they've got normal it's not like they got like really loose wavy hair like maybe you'll find in amongst the kind of like Amhara people they've got you know African hair just just like kind of, you know, probably like my hair, you know, very, very curly African hair and they can grow it incredibly long using these really ancient techniques. So I've got a video coming on that because that really opened my eyes to a lot, really, really opened my eyes to a lot. So I'll be sharing that with you guys soon. Once again, you see it here, where are the red people? These are preserved, really well preserved artworks. Look at the reddish brown. Okay, look at the reddish brown. Look at the African hairstyles. Okay. You can see it there. There's, it's a deliberate thing. Okay. Reddish brown, African hairstyles. There's just no two ways about it. So you can find a lot of preserved artworks that show you what they might have looked like before they faded Okay, you can find a lot of them. Okay. Which tomb is this? I'm trying to remember the names of the tombs. This might be the tomb of Roy. I hope I give you the right names. I, I wish I'd written them down. <laughs> it's really annoying. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but you can see it's just the, the same thing over and over again. And then where are the yellow women? Have a look at this. So actually, this is really good. I want you to stay with me here. OK, this is really good. So they talk about the fact that women are yellow and the men are red. OK, so many Eurocentrists talk about that. And this I'm going to blow that out of the water right now. OK, I'm going to blow that out of the water right now. And I want you to pay attention to this. Remember, I spoke to you about the fact that what we're normally seeing is the undercoat and actually that yellow tone that you're seeing was probably the undercolor and the red tone was probably the undercolor and the top color was probably a more brownish tone that kind of brought it all together and actually this is very common in African households as well I know this is going to sound really bizarre to some people but actually it's very common for women to have a slightly yellowy undertone. I'm not saying that this is the absolute reason because there might have been a spiritual implication. In fact, that's much more likely. But actually, it's very common as well that women have a quite a yellowy undertone whilst men have a red one. That's actually really common. I've got that in my family right now. So my daughter, my youngest daughter, has got a very yellow undertone. She's obviously brown-skinned, you know, but she's got a very yellow undertone, whereas my son's got a very red undertone. Um... I'm not saying this is consistent, but once again, these are just phenotypic traits that if you if you don't believe that 
you know, black people have any variety and we believe we're all black, you won't see it. But if you come from an African household or come from a, a, a melanated household, you see all of these different phenotypic traits playing out through family, playing out through members, people that you know. Now, I know I've rambled a bit, but why am I raising that? Let's have a zoom in at this picture and have a look. What is the difference between this man here and this woman here? What's the difference between their tone? I would argue the difference is the undertone. The men have a reddish undertone. And not all of them, by the way, some of them. <laughs> and the women have a yellowish undertone. So have a look at these women. Every other woman here has a yellowish undertone. This woman here has a slightly yellower undertone than the man. Because these images aren't faded, we're just zooming out and we're just seeing oh, a bunch of, you know, deep brown African people. That's all we're seeing. A bunch of deep brown. But if you look in and you zoom in, you actually see that it's the undertone that has been used here. These women have a yellow undertone. These men have a reddish undertone. You can see it clearly. They're not portraying people of a different race. They're not portraying the fact that the men go out in the sun and the women don't. They're just portraying accurately perhaps how phenotype plays itself out on the African continent sometimes. And a lot of people just don't realise that. They don't understand how African phenotypic diversity works. You know, it, the mind boggles sometimes. I mean, I'm going through this entire slideshow and I've shown you guys literally probably coming on hundreds of photos at this stage. And I really do wonder what the um, pathology of <laughs> Eurocentrists is and the kind of Arab centrists. I really do wonder about it because it's like, how do they, how do they kind of, compute or cope when they see these you know clearly african people you know i mean when they look at this do they really think that these were were not africans because i i struggle i i actually do struggle with that i'm like what what's going on in the mind there you know what's going on in the mind there i don't understand it's not once again remove complexity and see what you see, and <laughs> both African. No two ways about it. Well, I'm trying to see if there's... So, in essence, I think that, yeah, so I, I showed this image as well, because this tone here, which they would try and portray as a normal skin tone is an example of that what would have been that bright yellow because this is a sarcophagus so I'm assuming that this would have been gold initially or that kind of bright yellow to represent gold all right not a skin tone in this case okay unless you believe that this is a, a giant person who's been wrapped up <laughs> we know that this is a sarcophagus okay we know that this is a sarcophagus so once again, just how they use different colours is often manipulated to try and tell a different story. These are Africans carrying a golden sarcophagus. Not that difficult to behold. And that one's a bit hard. I can't zoom into this one. I think it's too small. Oh, this is such a beautiful picture. I wish I could zoom in. I wonder if I can... Oh, it doesn't really zoom very well. Oh, there you go. It zooms a bit. It's a wonderful picture of our African sister. I love this because it's just something so pure. And I want to say kind of like, just like something so villagey about it. <laughs> you know, this is just an image you would see in every, in many, many African societies. What a beautiful picture this is. Once again, the same reddish brown. It's exactly the same reddish brown. Acknowledging the fact that Africans aren't necessarily super light skinned or super dark skinned. Most of them are just this kind of medium brown tone. Let me zoom out. Did 
This is a really good image as well. I don't know why my images have all shrunk. Did I just get little images towards the end? It looks like I did. And once again, I've shown this image because you can see once again, the comedic men, the comedic women, and the golden sarcophagi, okay? The golden sarcophagi, the women are actually mourning there. I think they're covering themselves in ashes or something like that. It's a sign of mourning. I don't think I have that much more than that. I'm trying to see, let me just quickly have a scroll through, see if there's any other major points. I don't think there was, yeah, I think we had kind of, that was kind of it. I mean, I could keep going on, but I think we've beleaguered the point at this stage. Okay, so the question that we are trying to answer at the start of this is, oops, that's not it. <laughs> where's my where's my thingy gone? Did I, did I scroll through once again? Maybe it's the next one. Scroll along. They're gone. Wait, there? No. Okay, I'll have to find it. <laughs> Bear with me. Let me find it really quickly. The... Da -da -da. Here we go. Let's put it back on the screen. So the question that we were trying to ask before is, were the ancient Kemetic people read? Were they read? Okay. And I think that having looked through several scores of photos <laughs> showing you that essentially all statuettes of ancient Kemetic people show them in a brown red tone or deep brown or dark brown sometimes jet black <laughs> but the bright red that you that is sometimes being advertised by arab and eurocentrist you can see it just doesn't have the support okay they weren't advertising the a bright red sunburnt people it was a natural brown tone that you see in and around africa certainly in and around the Nile Valley. And it wasn't exclusive, once again, to that colour. You, sometimes you saw, like I said, the darker browns. Sometimes you even saw lighter, like I showed you with that very kind of light-skinned statue. To me, it's all expressions of African phenotypic diversity. Okay? And sometimes that's just literally the way it goes. So um, I hope that that was to some degree eye-opening to you guys i think i'm going to i'm quite willing to have a little bit of a q a with you guys have a discussion hit up the likes and we'll talk for a little bit and then i'm gonna roll out okay so um yeah that was it i told you it wasn't gonna be that deep in terms of i didn't feel the need today to go into kind of like deep um you know looking at you know studies and <laughs> peer reviews and stuff like this look sometimes it's good to just look at the artwork as it exists because you know when i first got into you know essentially researching african history it's amazing how much more is available in terms of imagery than it was when i first started you know this this journey you know over 20 years ago and it was so hard to find you know images you know you'd have to go to obviously museums which is obviously still good to do but it was so hard to find anything but now it's obviously get it's getting easier and easier and it's, there's so much of this imagery propagating that you can see that in spite of what they shove under your nose like the seated scribe and they'll shove that on a you know <laughs> on the currency you can see actually the average portrayal of a comedic person such as in the statuettes in villages when they show people was very very consistent red was the undertone red was mixed in as a color but it wasn't the target the target was a very very deep brown so that's all there is to it really um let's go through some comments <sighs> i feel like it's been a minefield in the comments <laughs> let's have a look let's have a look um I'm going to go from the last comment that I selected. Here it is. So let me just unselect that and let me see what's going on. Okay. Um, Miss KK, you just missed out when you said the black hair. I'd already picked someone. Sorry about that. So did you, SY. Um, 
you don't belong to that. I don't know what that means. When we say black, we are not saying everyone has to be deep, dark skinned. Come on now. Black has a range of skin tones. Yeah. What that hair looked like and them lips as well. I don't know what that who that was in response to, but you're absolutely spot on. I mean, even look at your photo, whoever that is. Like, you'd, I'm, I'm assuming you're phenotypically or politically described as a black person, but your skin tone is far from black. <laughs> you know, I would say it's a, a very, you know, medium to light brown, probably lighter than most of these, you know, comedic artworks. And yet they'll they'll turn around and say, how dare you make someone black? You know, it's, it's quite funny. Um, uh, let's have a look. Um... trying to see if there's any ones that I can kind of add some content to. Okay, so the Nebumum depictions both may be accurate in old pictures of myself as a teen. One looked a very dark tone in another from the same year. Jerry Carday's almost light complected. That's very true. It could be a a reflection of just maybe aging or even moving to a, a different <laughs> different place and having more exposure to the sun you know unlike certain people say like unlike Meta Sean says you know regardless of black people are inside or outside they are just black that's not actually true okay <laughs> first of all black people are black we're brown and secondly we do darken considerably um depending on how much sun we get <laughs> so so yeah, actually that's actually a very good point it could be it could but they could both be true i still feel like the stele arts of the nebel moon are faded i've seen them they just look faded everything looks pastel that's probably the easiest way to describe it if you see the nebel moon portraits um and the stele works they all look like pa everything's pastel and that just gives that obviously impression that everything has basically come down a few tones so that's kind of how i how i view that um Right, it was it was fiery in the comments today, wasn't it, guys? <laughs> I'm trying to find a peaceful comment to read out. <laughs> it's 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 really on one, guys. You're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to put some moderators. You're gonna have to get control of this. <laughs> Uh, yes this is and i think i'm gonna guess when you made this comment kanari about africans also being light-skinned was when i had that woman holding a basket above her head which is the point i was trying to make she could be light-skinned she could be a light-skinned african um she could be of many phenotypes there's we we don't know i'm not gonna make a i'm not gonna presume i know exactly where she's from or what what she represents because she could have just been a lo like i said a local who was just light-skinned the point is the overall population population was brown to darker absolutely and i think that's what was illustrated in the artworks that we looked at okay you know um your metatron accent is cracking media <laughs> sorry i can't help it you know when someone says a few things that really jar the hell out of you and then you just can't forgive them? You just hold it against them forever. Um, I bet you if we if we met in a bar, we'd be really good friends. <laughs> That's the irony. <laughs> but he's just irritated me so much with some of his stuff. Oh, dear. Um, this is a good question. Proper Perspective said... Canari, interesting. So that's in regards to the point that I just made. Um, are you there for thumbs up or thumbs down on using the word black in connection with African people? Th See, this is the thing. I've pondered over this so much. Black is a, first of all, calling us black people is something that has been imposed on us. And we have to, we have to be real about that. Okay. So us becoming black people was an imposition. We have to make sure that we understand that, okay? Our decision to take pride in that and to unify on that basis is a response to that imposition. And that's a position that I choose to take. So it's, it's a weird one. 
I know that black is ultimately meaningless because you know I'm not I'm not black. My skin isn't black. My skin is brown. It's not descriptive of what I look like. It's a label that was given to people that look like me in order for economic advantage to be given to people who don't look like me. So I definitely get that. But at the same time, my choice to acknowledge that I'm a part of that group and to take pride in the accomplishments of that group and to unify with other people who are, you know, placed within that group. That's a choice that I make. So it's really it's a, it's a, it's a really complicated discussion because in, in one ways I, I, I'm not allowing other people to define me, but at the same point, I'm not going to reject that label outright because if you're going to give me that label, then fine, I'll take that label and I'm going to ride with the other people that have that label and we're going to take pride in what we've achieved together. It's it's weird. It's weird. I don't know. I haven't got a, a really perfect answer for that. I think it's a very good question, um, proper perspective, because I don't know. I don't know where I don't know what the proper answer is. <laughs> you know, that's a good name, said 100. And we care too much about the approval of people with an obvious agenda. They know the truth. So dealing with them is a waste of time. Absolutely. I've got so many people who come at me regularly and they're like oh this person's made a video responding to you are you gonna respond to them i'm like no what the hell for they're irrelevant <laughs> do you think i make these videos so i can get into pointless back and forths and straw man arguments with eurocentrists arguing them in a in a world that they they love a world of trickery and deceit and stupidness like i haven't got better things to do now it's okay i've got a community here that i'm serving here you know so that's you know one of the reasons why i don't waste my time with you know people who are essentially out to waste my time I totally agree with that I'm out to you know spread the knowledge that we can use you know that's absolutely what my intention is um they hated the fact they had African noses so they destroyed them and they flooded Nubian temples to and stole the artifacts yep that's all true there's just nothing I can really add to that it's perfectly stated <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I like what you're saying, proper perspective. I haven't got, a, I haven't disagreed with you at all, to be honest with you. We need to build our own industries and feed our own information into our schools. And I think that's actually one of my goals here. Obviously, this channel, I love doing this channel and I love the community and building around it. But I think one of the things that has given me more than anything is the influence that I've, for, I mean, I've shared with you guys before that I come from an educational background. So, you know, I am fully qualified teacher um, as a profession um, for several years, um, for a very, very long time. Um, and one of the things that's actually really played into me wanting to do this channel, and I've got other social networks that I set up in the past as well. But ultimately, I want to be able to influence as many people as possible. <laughs> and particularly if you look at, you know, our education systems across Africa and across the diaspora, we need to be in charge of them. Um, I'm not going to go on too much of a rant because it kind of goes off topic of what the video is about. But there's so much that can be done, you know, in terms of education. And I think that a lot of it begins with us teaching our children their history and not allowing them to be taught it at school you know people relying on kind of like you know essentially western teachers to teach black history you, you, that's that's not going to happen i'm just being totally honest with you black history month has done immeasurable damage to the psyche of diaspora people in the in the uk i can't i can't speak for america but in the uk black history month the way it's taught has done immeasurable damage to the psyche of the young. I wasn't taught black history in school and I was very grateful for the fact that I wasn't taught black history in school because the way they teach black history, you know, when they started teaching my, you know, teaching my children black history at school, I had to go to school, literally go to the school and tell them, you ain't teaching my, don't teach my kids this anymore. Don't, don't teach them anymore. Just be quiet. I don't, I don't want you teaching them. So when you have a black history class, you send my kids out and then it forced me to be on the front foot and I had to start teaching my kids their history. Literally, that's how 
that's the position I had to take. So there's a lot of work to do, but I don't think it's, I think even on this channel itself, this channel allows me, always allow me to build up a repository of knowledge that becomes very easy to share. So it's it's really good. It's kind of a good starting place um, and it's going to build into something better that we can use. Um, let me scroll down. I bet you people have seen a load that I'm missing out on. Uh, have you heard of the term red bone? Yeah, of course. Of course I have. Um, well, I don't know why you asked. <laughs> Um, is that in, in, in terms of the red undertone? Well, that's normally, we, I mean, red bone refers to people who are really, really light, really, really light skinned and black. Um, I, and I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. Um, I, I think that's what you got. I've, well, you, I was going to say it's an American term, but I think it has its origins in, in the Caribbean, if I, know, if, I, if I remember correctly. I think they were the first ones to start calling people red bone. Um, Oh dear, there's so much here. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see if there's any other. I'm probably gonna shoot off soon. There is a lot in there, and I'd love to read them out, but these are such loaded topics that I'm gonna be here all night. And how long have we been live for? Let me just check out the time. It's been. Yeah, it doesn't say. That's useful. Well, I'll look at the time. It's been nearly two hours because I went live at nine. So I'm going to call it a day. I promise this wasn't going to be a long live stream. So as usual, I lied. <laughs> it was a long live stream. But as usual, also, it was an absolute pleasure. Guys, thank you for joining me today. Um, I hope it was informative. And I hope that you feel empowered by it. Um, and I hope you've learned something new. Um, message me, Michael. If you want to get in contact, Michael, you said you would like to speak to me about a project. Um, you can message me directly on Patreon or on Instagram or on, oh, oh my gosh, I forgot. Here's one thing that I didn't share. Okay, I have set up um, a Discord. How about that? Okay, people are asking me to get a Discord live and I think I shared it. But Discord does exist. Okay, so Discord, there is a King's Monologue Discord now. So if you want to chat with King Mono, <laughs> yeah, if you want to chat with me, please do uh, join in Discord. If you're looking for a link, I'll post the link in the comments. I'll also, there's also a post that I've recently done that hasn't, but I'd, it didn't really get shared from what I can see. So I'll have to, I'll do a new post, but I'll post the link in this video as well. And I'll try and post a link to the, um, to my socials in the, in the YouTube kind of like link section. So it's on my page as well. I'm just gonna quickly um, highlight Firefly cause he's given me a donation that I really appreciate. I hope I didn't miss anyone's donation by the way cause I was um, in a zone and the comments were flying by. Thank you very much Firefly for the fi five pound. I really appreciate it. Um, do you ever plan on doing a video about Kutsul, sorry the Kutsul um, incense burner and the iconography of the crown of Upper Egypt being used in Nubia prior to Kemet? I didn't think of doing a video about it, um, but why not? Um, I certainly need to do some re more research in that area. Um, I wouldn't have enough knowledge at this stage to do it, but I would love to look into that. And obviously, by the way, guys, if I haven't said this to you before, I would say 90% of my topic topics come from comments. <laughs> a lot of you don't know that. So a lot of time people will leave a comment on one of my videos and it will lead me down a bit of a rabbit's hole and i'll be like that's really interesting and i look at it so that's actually what happened with the um with my the crocodiles video so if you watch the crocodiles documentary i made all of that research started with a comment that someone made i can't remember who read, who made the comment but they basically you know highlighted the point about the fact that there was the two species of crocodile on the nile and one was from west africa the other one was from east africa i was like oh that's really interesting and then obviously what ensued was two weeks of very in-depth research and the documentary came out the other end. So don't think that anything that you post on here is not inspiring. It very much is. So do please do, you know, leave, you know, 
comments and suggestions and stuff and when I can I'll take them on board so I appreciate that Firefly I'll have a have a look see if I can do that um Talia says thank you this presentation was very informative really intense discussions yeah I appreciate it I appreciate it was it was um it's one of those yeah it, w it was an interesting topic it wasn't there's nothing that was like massively um complex like I said but it's just worth sometimes us taking the time to kind of go through some of the artifacts Tracy um I appreciate you so much you do this literally every live stream so much I appreciate it hi TK I love it when you bring receipts yeah the receipts today were quite easy ones they were all pictures I appreciate you so much that's a gen so generous um and it really helps so thank you so much Tracy you know I, I you know I how much I appreciate you um, the FR the FR tribe are the commissions now. Google, I know about the FR tribe, but once again, don't take a monolithic viewpoint when it comes to ancient Kemet. That's the one thing I'll say to you. If there's one thing I've learned about ancient Kemet is if you're looking for the one tribe that represents ancient Kemet, you won't find them. Um, I'm of the mindset, and people can agree or disagree. Um, I'm not saying I'm right, but I've, certainly my research has led me down the mindset that the 42 gnomes of Kemet represented different ethnicities and actually it's been supported somewhat by a lot of literature where it was clear that there was different phenotypes expressed through the different gnomes there were different people different groupings of people in the different gnomes of Kemet and also I would add on to that the expanse of time from old to middle to new kingdom also had an effect on the different people that people then that, that came out of ancient Kemet but yes, I, I would agree Afar has a lot of cultural continuity, as do the Inguni, as do the Oromo, as do modern Nubians. As, I mean, there's just so many people in Africa, as do Akan, um, as do, I mean, I could I could keep going. There's so many different, as do the um, Fulani. There's so many different ethnicities that reflect very clearly ancient Kemetic culture. So trying to pinpoint which one is very difficult. Jolene, thank you so much for your donation. I appreciate you. Um, I wish you had left a comment, um, but that's just uh, obviously a show of love. So I appreciate that so much. And Afrispora, we always have very good conversations. Thank you so much for that donation. That's very, very, very generous of you. So I was just trying to see if you left a comment. I wouldn't mind highlighting your comment. You normally have something very wisdomous to say. <laughs> I know wisdomous isn't a word, but you normally have something very wise to say. It would have been nice to pop that on the screen where you haven't put it on there. If you do feel to like adding some content, I would love to highlight it. So yeah. Um, the Dogons as well. Someone's mentioned the Dogons. They represent certainly the Kemetic priesthood. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in terms of the African continent and cultures and ethnicities that represent it. I think one of the things that we suffer from, and this isn't an insult to anyone, but this is just a kind of a remnant of us growing up in a European society, is Europe is obsessed, and I mentioned this in the last live stream, Europe is obsessed with monoliths. They're obsessed with there being one kind of people and that one kind of people represents the one kind of look or the one kind of this and the one kind of that and so therefore we're always looking for a single race or a single this or a single that and that's because they are very phenotypically and genotypically narrow they are the result of a subset but when you're on the african continent you're looking at the superset and this superset represents multiple ethnicities over a very small very small expanses of land essentially okay and, and Kemet was a very large expanse of land Egypt is a very you saw in the last one of the last streams I did when we were looking at the maps how big Africa is and how big Egypt is and how big Nubia was in comparison to Europe so bear in mind the oldest continent with people moving around for you know thousands of years you're going to have m multiple ethnicities running along the, the Nile not just a single one so much i appreciate you for that lovely donation i appreciate you guys so much um yeah um thank you that's all i can say really thanks so much
I'm just trying to look, make sure I was literally about to jump off, but then people started leaving all these great comments. I think there's a little bit of a, a time delay sometimes <laughs> when I'm on these live streams. So you guys maybe get caught behind an ad wall or something like that. And as a result, you're like a minute behind me or so. So there's a bit of activity coming in now. So I feel like I might stay on for just a little bit longer. Kanari, thank you, my brother. Appreciate you so much, man. I'm glad this was, to be honest with you, when I go to these live streams, I'm always worried about how informative or uninformative they're going to be. <laughs> and I always feel like I could have prepared some of them for a bit longer. Um, but when we get there, it always feels like it's quite um, quite an interesting, yeah, it's quite an interesting discussion. So it works out in the end. And I think you guys are very forgiving as well. So I <laughs> appreciate you so much. Um, I don't understand what you mean after this person here has called himself African American says they weren't just black there were a few types of Nubian as one of them this explains where some were clearly black and other in, and others aren't in art I don't, I don't know what you mean with that statement it doesn't make I don't, I don't understand what you mean like new, are you saying you're going back to this idea that all the black people would have been portrayed with one skin tone, which is black? I'm assuming that you're saying it's black. No, the Nubians, or at least the the Kushites, or even the people who weren't Kushites, there were other African ethnicities that were portrayed as very deep black, were a very deep black kind of African. But then you have lighter medium toned Africans who are every bit as African and every bit as politically black as we are now. So you can't single out the ones and say, well, only the really dark ones were black. That doesn't, that's not how it works. It's literally kind of the reverse of what we're trying to kind of educate you with at the moment. But I appreciate the comment nonetheless. Firefly, thank you so much. LOL, this is so random, but everybody check out German Tattoo, oh, Wild Men and the Moors. Ooh, okay, you're going down. Uh, this is this is a topic we are going to touch on. By the way, I do, by the way, I do touch on 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 melanated Europe. We're gonna get there. I know I keep promising to get there, but we are gonna get there. Okay, it's not something that I've touched on yet, but I do have reconstructions of Queen Elizabeth and Queen Charlotte to show you, and they are going to shock you. Yes, melanated Europe is a real thing. Okay, and I've and I know a lot of people are not going to be ready for that, but I think yeah, Wild Men and the Moors. Have a look at that. It will blow your mind. Um, people have reached out to me personally. I've kind of recommended a couple of books to kind of get you started on that journey. But there's a there's a whole world of um, shock that is about to come your way if you think that this world is as black and white as it's been sold because it, it's not. It really isn't. But yeah, um, that was a good one. I like the way you kind of like masked that in a donation as well so I couldn't skip over it. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate you. Uh dear. That's a good one. Um, I'll check out your channel, Jin Toda Don, who said he's just posted the Wild Men Tapestry on his channel. I'll check that out. This is an interesting one. Where are the ancient commissions, commissions now? Can you do a video on this? This is a really loaded one because it really depends what school of thought you come from. It really does depend on what school of thought you come from. Um, so, the obvious uh, the obvious question, or the obvious response, I should say to that is, many of them are present. They're called Nubians, okay? Um, so you do have a, a big, a huge cluster that remain. You can find them in Aswan. Um, some of them have diffused into the Egyptian population. So some modern Egyptians who we would not today classify as black are still essentially carrying ancient Kemetic blood, you know, as a process of diffusion, it does happen. So you can't draw these kind of very linear lines and say everyone who's lighter than this is is not Kemetic. That's ridiculous. Okay, it's not the way um, human interaction and breeding works. There's going to be a degree of, you know, the, your race is going to tell very little about your ancestry, you know. So we have to, you know, have we have to come to that acceptance that, yeah, your race doesn't tell everything about your ancestry. OK, um, your race can change or your you can have white grandkids. Anyone who's jet black in here could have white grandkids. 
right? <laughs> They're still as related to you as your black grandkids. So you have to bear that in mind, okay? You have to bear that in mind. Now, the point I'm making is this. You've got the Nubians that have stayed. You've got several groups across Africa that can trace their heritage back to ancient Kemet. Several who have the oral tradition who say we're from here. So it's really loaded. So I know there's a lot of, there's Fulani sects, I would say. I wouldn't say the entire Fulani group, but it's definitely Fulani sects who believe they come from ancient Kemet. There's some parts of the Yoruba culture that believe they're from Kemet. I know there's some parts of the Benin culture that believe they're from Kemet. There's some part, obviously, the we've talked about the Ba'antu, who have, you know, traceable cultural traits. The question is, some of these will be from Kemet. Some of them will have a shared origin, but not necessarily be from Kemet. Some of them might have been a part of the Green Sahara. Some of them might have... So it's so... It, basically, it's going to require a lot of research and archaeology. And this is one of, the, one of the original bits of kind of research that I thought would re be really important for us to do as a um, as a bit of research um, was the name, which is why I was doing the kind of name linkages. I wanted to see where do ancient Kemetic names exist? Where do they play out? So obviously we have like names like Sankara, which is, you know, an, an old kingdom name that we know exists in Burkina Faso today. Um, we have a lot of Kemetic names in Uganda, loads, loads and loads in Uganda. Um, Amin, um, Kaure, so many. We also have a very massive preponderance of names that end in Ra, Ka and Ba, which are all ontological notions of Kemet. And that's probably one of the, probably one of the most common name suffixes i know that's probably not the word correct word but the name endings that you can get in africa is ra or re that's very very common very very common ra or re so there's so much of that that kind of like plays out across the african continent but it's going to take a lot of research to find out essentially where the direct the kind of yeah the the the, the direct um migrations from Kemet have taken place because not all of them I don't believe all of Africa came from Kemet <laughs> okay I'm going to make that very very clear and I'm not by any means kind of pushing that all of Africa came from Kemet I think that most African cultures have a rich enough history by themselves they don't need to come from Kemet and maybe they did not come from Kemet and also the fact that there were civilizations before Kemet that where these kind of shared origins could have come from. I think a lot of African history exists across the um, Saharan Basin, the Green Sahara. I think we're, the more research we uncover, the more we're going to realise how much of an impact that has had on the African culture. So this whole idea of these two massive cultures forming along the Sahara and forming along the Nile and diffusing throughout Africa, I believe that's going to come out of a lot of... Um, original African research that takes place. So, yeah. Um, can you do... This is an interesting one. Can you do a video on tribes in Africa that have Semitic roots? Um... It would be interesting research to do, um, but it's difficult because sometimes the Semitic root is an assumption based on, basically the root is Cushitic. And this is the thing, African language families have been greatly kind of muddled up and confused. Okay. If you look at Semitic, Semitic is a branch of proto-synactic. Um, which is a branch of Afro-Asiatic. So when we're talking about Semitic, we're talking about a language family, unless you're taking the biblical approach and when you're talking about children of Shem. 
but either which way Semitic as we understand it as a term as a language family and it's one that descends from Afro-Asiatic which um, then gave birth to proto sinaitic which then gave birth to um, Semitic and one of the Semitic language families is Ar is Arabic for instance in fact it's probably the most prominent one apart from Berber which is also being classified as Semitic now some of the Cushitic language families and some of the language families that have even been related to Semitic that are existed in East Africa predate Arabic and are actually closer or more closely related to a language called Ge'ez which actually predates so Ge'ez actually predates um, Arabic but it's listed as a Semitic language so this is where it gets you get older scripts in Ge'ez than you do of Arabic, basically. And this is how we know that Ge'ez predates Arabic. But under the language tree, it's one that kind of comes from the Semitic branch. So this is where it gets quite a confusion. And I think there's been a lot of kind of like, basically, we have to classify our own language families. Otherwise, some of this stuff gets ultimately quite meaningless. <laughs> um, and when you've got people like, you know, Wallace Budge, for instance, who translates the ancient, um, who translates the Medunetta and makes it available for people to see, and he's greatly discredited now in the West. Why is he greatly discredited in the West? Because he relied on African language families, continental African language families, to make his translation. And they don't like that. They don't like the fact that he used the African continent as the source. So if you look at the new translations, of the Medinetta, the, the later ones that came after Budge, they want to make it as closely related to Coptic, which then pushes it towards the east and pushes it slightly more towards the Mediterranean because we know Coptic was a bridging language between Greek and ancient Kemetic was a bridging language that existed. So they're pushing, the modern translations push it more towards Coptic, but that's why I use Budge's translations for, because he uses the African language. So it's really interesting how that kind of all plays out. But yeah, all right. I'm going to play a bit of music and I'm going to let it play out now because I think we've been on here for long enough and it's really late. So I appreciate everyone. Thank you for joining me on the King's Monologue and I'll see you on the next one. Let's do that again. <laughs>